One of the most iconic self-portraits of the last century is the 1960s piece Triple Self-Portrait by American illustrator Norma Rockwell. Created as a comedic yet humble cover of his autobiography, the piece easily outgrows its simple origins to more complex readings. Like the simultaneous depiction of Rockwell as painter, observer, and public figure, how the surrounding props stand in as symbols for the artist's life and personality, or the implications of grandiose vanity in lining the creation with portraits of the great historical artists. Perhaps the most fascinating interpretation would be as a sort of logical next step from Magritte's Knot Pipe, where the depicted knot artist decides to make another artist that is equally non-existent. And so the recursion goes. The idea being that a fairly skilled employment of realism would be used to its benefit and goes so far in its simulated reality that this fiction then gives way to another layer within itself. That is to say, realism can be used to make that painting within a painting look like another real painting. The half-finished portrait can only be portrayed as convincingly complete and intentional if it resides within a context that makes it clear that it is merely a depiction within something grander. This could be argued as realism at its peak. That the artist was only really striving for it as a framing device for conveying things required to exist within a second realm of simulation to truly work. On a larger scale, this exact same mindset translated to the rapid onset of technology. Like, if you've got all that horsepower to make a beautiful game like Super Mario Odyssey, you could likewise just use that potential to create something like Paper Mario, where Mario and his friends are portrayed as paper in a carefully detailed ironic farce of realism. Because just like how Norman Rockwell's self-portrait within a self-portrait is somehow perceived as the most real part of that piece, the lifelike simulation of handcrafted paper is more convincing as an approximation of reality than the Mario games without that extra layer of distance. Again, in other words, this Paper Mario looks like a real piece of paper more than this Mario looks like an actual person. And that Mario comparison isn't used so much because Mario is the most obvious video game franchise, although it sure is convenient. It's more so because in a game context, no other publisher seems as infatuated with this visual aesthetic as Nintendo having constantly returned to it again and again over the years, despite it never really gaining any significant traction in the rest of the industry. And there is perhaps something to learn from studying the roots of this practice and analyze how it evolved over the years to what it is today. 
first couple of decades, video games were chain-bound to strict technical limitations when rendering visual elements. Whenever Pixel was precious real estate, any little boost in capacity was a milestone. A few more colors on the screen could be enough to sell one game over its contemporaries. So any drastic leap away from looking like anything else at the time was unthinkable, or at best, some arcade cabinet trickery. Games were still firmly lumps of pixels meant to symbolize scenarios, more than accurately depict them. Like, this hunk of young is apparently an adult human man called Mario. And this right here is his little brother, Luger. Okay. In a sense, the video game aesthetic was set. And as such, any deviation had to pertain to those rules. Arguably, the first attempt to emulate other media into games would have been the cutscene, in which control is taken away from the player to show a pre-scripted sequence that might establish what little traces there were of a story. It's a movie, of sorts. Not particularly convincing as a form of film, though. It would take many years still for people to point to cutscenes and say they actively look like a movie, more than just a pause in action. But it was a start. A more substantial birth for video game graphics emulating other media would be a slew of home computer games from 1986 to 1988 that used the visual language of comic books in their presentation. From Dan Dare's speech balloons that act more as interface flavor to Batman's clever panel transitions, the idea of making games look like comics quickly evolved from nifty exterior to a way of contextualizing the game world in a new way. Years later, this idea would be fully realized with the Mega Drive title Comic Zone, a graphically impressive game that not just looked like a comic book page, but more importantly, played like one. The player would jump between panels to progress both spatially and chronologically in order to successfully beat up the mutant opposition. It's an awfully clever game for its time and shows how the visual mimicry can not just make a game look nice, but also inform the overall design. Released around the same time as Comic Zone was the Super Nintendo classic Yoshi's Island which equally looked like someone had made it. Well, uh, that is to say it looks like someone drew the graphic... Mm. No. Uh, the graphics in Yoshi's Island are portrayed in such a way that it leaves traces of having been sloppily hand-painted by a child instead of looking like a perfectly refined computer image. The angle of pastel crayons was birthed by newly recruited character designer Hisashi Nogami after being tasked by director Shigefumi Hino to make the game look hand-drawn which was achieved by arduously reworking scanned drawings into serviceable pixel art. Judging by the Super Donkey prototype, it's clear that the game always had an idea of shoddy environments, but that the pastel backgrounds and foregrounds were what gave the existing level assets an idea of playfulness. In truth, apart from some thick outlines, most things in Yoshi's Island aren't actually portrayed as being made in crayon. You are merely given that impression by the overwhelming amount of real estate the backgrounds had in the presentation. It's effectively attracting your attention and coloring your perception from there. But in that way, it still absolutely works. And Yoshi's Island completely sells you on the idea that this game is a child's drawing come to life. This was to contrast Yoshi's Island with earlier games that used cheeky shortcuts towards realism, particularly Donkey Kong Country, which had pivoted hard to the idea of using 3D rendered graphics to approach something more real and tangible in a rather literal way. The Yoshi's Island developers wanted to distinguish themselves by creating the complete opposite, and possibly also to spite Donkey Kong. To kinda suggest that graphical capacity is not a one-dimensional path towards realism, that wild and imaginative aesthetics not only equally impress, but evidently age with more grace. 
Today, the graphical appeal of the Donkey Kong Country series lies more in its capturing of mid-90s pre-rendered 3D graphics. A sort of snapshot of a time when cutting edge looked like glossy plastic. It's all very quaint and slightly adorable in the best possible way, but know that this is a perspective on Donkey Kong Country that has emerged with age rather than intention. Rare sincerely wanted you to believe this ape was real and not some hip ironic ultra 90s retro render. Conversely, Yoshi's Island looks as fresh today as it ever did. And in hindsight, it's clear that whatever goal Donkey Kong Country reached graphically, games would have gotten there sooner or later regardless. In that sense, Yoshi's Island sticks out more as a game that still has a fairly unique presentation, and as such, in some way, has to be more important to whatever followed that path. Instead of trudging forward, it carved a completely different route for how to effectively portray games graphically. It's strikingly obvious in this context that games like Comic Zone and Yoshi's Island gave way to later titles like, say, Snipper Clips or Little Big Planet. They are unified in this idea of portraying a second layer of emulated fiction. Yet, they seem popularly defined on their own in a vacuum. People are quick to say that Yoshi's Island used a so-called crayon style, or that Snipperclips is endearing because of some papercraft style. But that fails to acknowledge how all these games are sprung from the same mindset, especially in an environment that suggests their presentation is in some way different from the rest. Trying to categorize each individual case by what form of subfiction they depict is missing how they're all striving towards the same goal. No, if we are to truly categorize the visual identity of these games under a stylistic umbrella, it would be with something more substantial in defining that core intent. Are you ready for it? These games are in their essence a clear-cut display of Skeuomorphism. The term skeuomorphism is a combination of the Greek words skeos and morph, meaning something like container or tool plus shape. In practice, it's a design sensibility for imitating previous visual motifs that would be inherent to the subject being portrayed, being seen at least as far back as ornamental features on Greek architecture as their buildings migrated from woodwork to masonry, it's practically ancient, but it was heavily popularized in modernity by user interface design in Apple software around the birth of smart devices. Think of the new stand on your old Apple devices and how it was intuitive precisely because it reminds us of real newsstands and magazines, even though they are obviously just digital approximations. It could pessimistically be defined as a mere superficial way of making a design interface look neat, or at best more approachable to new users. And in the long run, that hard emphasis on emulating traditional conventions was replaced with the now more common flat design. On the other hand, it's a heavy component for creating effective iconography, like the save button diskette or the landline phone receiver on call buttons. Little things that are so obvious that we easily take them for granted. And perhaps in this digital age, skeuomorphism can find a new life in culture. A really good example of this is the 2014 Lego movie, which in adapting the classic toy brand for film, took inspiration from a decades-old tradition of stop-motion animations people had previously made using real Lego. Because of the high-budget resources afforded by the filmmakers, they were able to use 3D technology to model virtual Lego figures that were then animated in a way to make it look like they were actual toys come to life by stop motion. In comparison with other animations by the Lego brand that basically just rigged the plastic characters to awkwardly move like regular people, the difference is night and day in portraying these like real moving toys. 
Again, these plastic people somehow feel more real than any other contemporary animated character. So in that way, it makes perfect sense how Yoshi's Story, the Nintendo 64 sequel to Yoshi's Island, exchanged the crayons for cardboard, fabric, newspapers, and cushions. It's a widening of that skeuomorphic handcrafted world, diegetically contextualized as a pop-up book this time. It's even the top selling point in the box. Innovative. And once again, during a time when everything basically had to be 3D, it's reassuring to see Yohi's story diligently go against that grain. And when listing Nintendo 64 graphics that still hold up to this day, there's basically only this and... Rakuga Kids? Mischief Makers? Oh yeah! And oh, Paper yes. Mario! Which was fittingly released in Japan as Mario Story. Once again, taking the concept of a pop-up picture book. It's now poetic symmetry with the development of Yoshi's Island. The graphical presentation of Paper Mario was burst by having the new kid come up with ideas. This time it was Naohiko Aoyama who submitted a prototype mock-up for fun, portraying flat 2D sprites within the depth of a 3D environment, presumably netting him the role of art director for the game. Looking back at the proof of concept in Aniwata Asks from 2012, he said, It's made of 3D polygons, but I drew it to have an atmosphere like that of a picture book transplanted into a video game, with paper-thin 2D background and characters. I think about that time there was a trend of going for realistic 3D in home consoles, but I thought it might be an interesting twist to make use of those capabilities to use 3D in emphasizing a 2D appearance. Boy golly, these games are just made by a bunch of little contrarians, aren't they? It's delightful, but also key in retroactively valuing these rather early examples of skeuomorphic design in Nintendo games. Because more so than any other example, the graphics in Yoshi's Island Story and Paper Mario were intended to break trends more than form the basis of game design. It's absolutely true that Yoshi's Island would have been a classic even without those pastel backgrounds, or that the first Paper Mario game does practically nothing to enforce a paper theme except having the characters look flat. They never even really acknowledge it, do they? No, the MO for these games was first and foremost to look different in a climate that truly made them stand out. They were more statements on what graphics could do, rather than how games can use those graphics in their core design. It just wasn't quite time for that yet. The second Paper Mario had some fun paper transformations and neat transitions, and the third might not have embraced the paper aspect as much as the flatness. It was after all inevitable that the series would adapt Edwin Abbott Abbott's 1884 novel Flatland sooner or later. It's a given, but that concept delves into more core aspects than the contextualization of paper. Just like in Flatland, Super Paper Mario explores the idea of people living in a two-dimensional world being met with a third-dimensional one, and how that mind-blowing reality-bending experience affects them. But it is not vital for Mario to be paper, as much as just a flat inhabitant of his own Flatland, which he basically is in a lot of games. For example, the 2012 indie game Fez is equally, if not even a better take on the classic dimension fable, without any need for their characters to actually be paper, as much as just them perceiving their world without depth. Closely associating flatness with paper is an easy metaphor, but it's not inherently necessary. The paradigm shift away from plain skeuomorphism to what we might call informed skeuomorphism surprisingly didn't happen with Paper Mario or Yoshi, but it fundamentally changed how those series were to evolve further, for better or worse. In the early 2010s, developers Goodfeel released Kirby's Epic Yarn for Wii, which was a take on Kirby purely from the view of textile fabric. This grass feels funny, Kirby thought. It feels like trousers. 
What's immediately clear when comparing this game to its predecessors is how the aesthetic isn't incidental, but fundamental. At this point, games that look different from the mainstream were increasingly common, especially with the rising indie scene. So just looking cool wasn't enough anymore. So Kirby's Epic Yarn sees Kirby not only presented in a yarn world, but completely interacting with it. He's hollow, so he can't swallow enemies like he usually does, but that malleable Kirby Fred could on the other hand take on wildly different forms, as well as function like a whip that might untangle or pull around parts of the level. Explaining further in an Iwata Asks interview from 2010, producer Etsunobu Ebisu said of the Jarn aesthetic. The person who came up with the original idea was Madoka Yamauchi, director of Wario Land The Shape Dimension. He's planning section manager of Goodfeel, and one day he came to me with that idea. When I asked him how he came up with it, he said it just sort of came to him. Right then and there, I thought it was a good idea and decided to come up with a proposal for a video game incorporating specifications unique to Yarn, and a game world with certain warmth to it. Of course, this exact combination of raw game mechanics could feasibly be contextualized in any number of ways, if you really wanted to. But on the other hand, it makes complete sense for the Yarn framing, and more importantly, we're not at all convinced this exact combination of ideas could ever emerge had it not been as much of a logical continuation of the aesthetic. Yoshi may not need to be crayon and cardboard, and Paper Mario could explore other ideas than just papercraft, but Kirby's Epic Yarn, to some degree, absolutely has to be yarn to be coherent. And it's all the better because of it. And looking into the development, everything makes even more sense. This game breaks away from a lot of the previously established Kirby traditions, precisely because it wasn't initially intended to be a Kirby game. For a long time, it was just a game about companion character Prince Fluff in his own yarn world. Only at a later stage was it decided that Kirby would be the star in the game, meaning that the groundwork is largely removed from whatever defines that series. However fitting it ended up being. It just goes to show that new ideas can shake up old concepts in the best possible way. And as such, it absolutely follows that by release, the game was critically compared to Yoshi's story rather than any Kirby game. Because from a design perspective, it feels more like a modern continuation of everything that game conveyed visually. And to put it more elegantly, up to this point, games had spoken their aesthetics to the players, but this time, the players could finally respond. Improperly classifying this specific concept, it must be noted that this form of game design isn't inherently reliant on skeuomorphic presentation, although that may be the most common and perhaps easily tangible case. For example, a game like Cuphead is technically not actually skeuomorphic, as it's created using traditional means and then digitized from there. The ideas that might follow in making a game that looks like an old cartoon are equally legit though. One thing in particular that Cuphead does to its benefit is taking the form of an arcade boss rush, with large expressive enemies to take down. The best strategy would be to keep your eyes on the bosses, so it follows that they are an absolute delight to watch, and makes telegraphing of their attacks a lot more clear. You probably didn't even notice it because it's just such a perfect fit. Likewise, a game like Ape Out has an audiovisual identity revolving around classic jazz albums and their cover design. It's not skeuomorphism, just an iconic design trend but it undoubtedly fits the game concept of wrecking havoc as a rampant gorilla. Simplicity and grit are fused as your actions literally perform the jazz music on the album you're witnessing. It would make no sense if this game looked like Donkey Kong Country, you know. <sighs> If we really broaden the scope, this idea might even be affected by hardware. 
A super good example would be the Nintendo 3DS, a handheld console by Nintendo that featured a 3D screen that created the illusion of depth in its upper display. This visual depth meant that flagship games like Super Mario 3D Land and A Link Between Worlds were more shaped around the idea of verticality than previous games in the franchises. Because the system's inherent presentation made that idea feel like a completely natural implementation of said technology. In other words, the idea of games using their visual presentation to inform game design isn't bound by skeuomorphism, even though that's definitely Nintendo's favorite way to do it. As such, it's not adequate to refer to this concept as informed skeuomorphism, or craft likes, or Yoshi souls, or whatever. Instead, we propose something like hard aesthetic to signify cases for when a game's unique aesthetic properties influence the execution of game ideas to the degree that they wouldn't make much sense without that visual presentation. For example, when comparing old and new Paper Mario, it's super clear how the emphasis on paper has evolved over the years. Because X, therefore Y. Because Mario is paper, therefore he can fold and act like paper. Because Mario is paper, his opposition are things that threaten paper. Because Mario is paper, the game mechanics should explore what you can do with paper. And actually, because Mario and his world are made out of paper, they can explore some really intense body horror without problem. Mario, it looks like you finally have to face your fears! The emphasis on paper has no bearing on the first game in the series, but absolutely defines the latest. One could be a sequel to Super Mario RPG or part of the Mario and Luigi series. The other absolutely has to be about paper. Hard aesthetic. Because that emphasis is heavy. And sure, Paper Mario might not have had the most appreciated evolution. There's a lot of charm aside from the aesthetics in the first game that is somewhat absent in later installments. But we'd like to pinpoint that Naohiko Aoyama, the guy who originally came up with the paper concept, worked as director for Sticker Star and Color Splash. In some ways, it makes perfect sense that he'd lead the series towards something that embraces that idea wholeheartedly. Like it or not, under Aoyama's lead, Paper Mario truly became Paper Mario. And whatever direction the series takes from here, we're certain that paper will always be the most important keyword going forward. For a more overall positive development, we need to go back to the start and look at whatever happened to Yoshi. The franchise that started with Yoshi's Island took a significant turn with Yoshi's story, and while that game may have helped in defining the character for other Nintendo media, especially Mario Kart and Super Smash Bros., reception was somewhat lukewarm. Releasing a 2D game in a 3D-obsessed era was not without controversy, especially as the game revolved around a point-collecting arcade experience. This in surprising contrast to the first game, which in hindsight feels like a poster child for the rise of modern game design during the mid-90s. A game tailor-made more for the home console experience rather than retaining any obsolete arcade elements. In a sense, one could say Island feels more like the Nintendo 64 game and Story like the Super Nintendo game. And even though we like and appreciate Yogi's story, we don't think it paid off in the end, as the series would take a near two decade break from stationary consoles after that. From here, the Yoshi franchise was handed over to Artoon and later Arcest, both being more or less the same company founded by Naoto Shima. 
famous for Blinks the Cat and Sonic the Hedgehog. Yoshi's Universal Gravitation. Not a college degree, but rather a game focused around gyro controls, passed by with little to no fanfare. EAD developed Touch and Go was basically such a zeitgeist example of early touchscreen games that it now looks like some fake plagiarism case you'd find on the App Store. The safe bet was porting Yoshi's Island and then doing the same thing on DS and then again on 3DS. It's at first glance puzzling how such a well-regarded classic could garner about zero interest in its sequels. But on closer inspection, it's clearly a case of little innovation and some sloppy execution. Perhaps with a pinch of some part of the audience valuing handheld games as, in some ways, lesser. But we digress. That's another discussion. So when Kirby's Epic Yarn developers Goodfeel finally got their hands on the Yoshi franchise after all of this, with 2015's Woolly World, the series was in a tampered state. We're not blaming anyone for skipping out on Yoshi's Woolly World or approaching its sequel Crafted World as a C-tier standard platformer, but we're telling you to please reconsider and reevaluate that notion. Because these two games are not just great and restores a lot of what made Yoshi's Island such an all-time classic, they're in our opinion the most complete execution of hard aesthetic in a Nintendo game. Goodfeel are masters of their craft, if you will, and whatever they do next, you should definitely pay attention. As expected, the idea of exploring levels of wool or craft translates directly to a slew of constantly fresh game concepts and ideas. Never slogging, always moving, as you explore all of the imaginative ideas that reside in Joshi's world. The skeuomorphic presentation is at surface level adorable, clever, and endlessly entertaining to watch in its fussy and cozy glory. But it's also conceptual brilliance that, especially in Crafted World, momentarily switches to a light meta angle. Literally. The name of the game is Observation. The collectathon aspect is executed by you having to pour over and analyze the environments in search for various items. Yoshi's Crafted World is made beautifully and made to be fully observed. When the camera then revolves around to show you the rear of the world, the skeuomorphic reality breaks as the first layer of reality, only theoretically hinted at in other games, is exposed. Tools, food packaging and undecorated material are laid bare to intentionally show you an unintended view of the fabricated world. This game seriously makes a reverse level trek about finding some dogs in a level you just played into an awkward and slightly unsettling reality shattering expose. Yoshi is practically one step away from just telling you up front that he's nothing but an unreal creation with no soul, constructed by some invisible third party with none of his inherently assumed charisma or allure and that his only purpose in this bleak reality is to entertain you as a player in his otherwise meaningless existence. It's bloody brilliant! Why aren't you playing this game right now? The planes are made out of toilet paper rolls! The fantastic good feel games and the later evolution of Paper Mario are prime examples of hard skeuomorphic aesthetic in modern Nintendo games. And for the last decade, these games together with stragglers like Nintendo Land, Snipper Clips or Kirby and the Rainbow Curse have firmly established how to use that design, either fundamentally or just visually. It's blatantly clear when Nintendo intends their latest title to retain these ideas because of how well they have established this practice in such a relatively short while. Yet, somehow, 
we find ourselves unavoidably facing what is perhaps the most confusing misconception of Nintendo's graphical intentions. In 2019, when Nintendo announced their Switch remake of the old Game Boy title, The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening, the controversy was about as intense as the initial Wind Waker backlash 18 years prior. In adapting the old pixel graphics, Nintendo chose to make a near one-to-one -one translation of all the streamlined design work present on the screen, just extensively upscaled. This meant cute little shibby Link in a pleasantly shabby and compact world, instead of whatever interpretive artwork present in promo materials from the time, implying that Nintendo were somehow unhappy and disappointed with the graphical presentation of the original game, as they, for some reason, imagined that the Game Boy would have been able to portray it in much higher fidelity? You do understand that they knew the specs of the Game Boy, right? It's both baffling and slightly ironic how a remake that tries to look as close to the original as possible is then criticized for somehow not being faithful. It seems some people spend a quarter century filling in whatever gaps they found in the Game Boy original to such a drastic degree that they ended up with a mental image that couldn't possibly be fulfilled by Nintendo's uncompromising renovation. Also something about this being a dark and depressive story? But we have another video for that so you can go watch that. The vast misconception seems to have emerged when the view of the original as some sort of adult grim tale clashed with the new. Whatever the remake was, it logically couldn't be a translation of the original as it didn't follow that perceived vision, but rather some modern convention. You know, that glossy shine and macro view of the sets make it look a bit like close-up plastic. Oh, what if it's meant to be toys, like in those other Nintendo games that look like things? Hey, check it out! There's even some old Japanese commercials with puppets! Puppets are toys, right? Okay, chill. Look, if your takeaway from looking at Link's Awakening is that everything is a plastic toy, that's fine, we see the reasoning, but from all we've previously established about skeuomorphic visual design, even without implementation of hard aesthetic, this feels pretty darn baseless. What bearing does a toy aspect have on this game? To what extent does it acknowledge such a design choice? How much creative flair does that add to the world? Fucking none! You want fucking Zelda's Tinker Toyland? Imagine that concept! Link would have a wind-up key on his back that could be used as a substitute for the Pegasus boots, or as a health boost to give himself more energy. Houses could be built with, like, alphabet blocks or something. What if every section of the world had a theme around some subset of toys? You could have bouncy ball enemies that go all over the place when you hit them, or plushy bear baddies that are impervious to blunt force, knights with hobby or rocking horses. We can totally imagine the jack-in-a-box boss that has to be lured out and then dodged before being attacked. The ideas just spew out and you actually think a company like Nintendo would just translate that to Huh, <laughs> glossy plastic link. In an interview, series producer Eiji Aonuma explained the notion of the game's presentation as being, so to say, cute, with the following. We didn't really intend on making it necessarily cute, but the original game was a small world that you kind of glimpsed into. We thought this diorama-like world that you could look in from an angle was a perfect fit for the remake. Link's Awakening is a little Game Boy adventure that you would bring with you on a tiny screen. It was a portable fit of something that had previously been a grand adventure for the home screen. As such, going back to it today, it might come across as small and quaint, and to retain that impression regardless of if you play it on the spiritually adequate Switch screen or the massive television set, the game's visual presentation is meant to reflect that. 
They wanted it to feel just as delightfully teensy-weensy today as it was back then. In many ways, it makes little sense to blow up a game designed for a handheld format to a grandiose home experience, especially as the game was already an adaptation of that. You'd kinda be going back and forth like a game of telephone, to the point where it's just some strange approximation of the original. Truthfully now, if you want a grand bombastic version of Link's Awakening, that's the link to the past, which was basically adapted by all subsequent Zelda games anyway. From Nintendo's view, it follows that a modernization of Link's Awakening should be as close to the original as possible, in order to not just become something else entirely. We may even question the idea of a 2D top-down Zelda ever having some mature air to them, as they always seem to be aimed towards more casual audiences. Suddenly enforcing such a twist on Link's Awakening would be profoundly detrimental to the core messages and ideas of that game. And a toy theme? Way too distracting. It doesn't work unless you make it your own thing. But um, you should totally do that, Nintendo. Call us. In the light of looking at how Nintendo's skeuomorphism and hard aesthetic evolved, executes itself, and what it definitely isn't, there is a stark contrast when comparing that practice to other companies. The idea of having nifty presentations that mimic natural materials and approximations of subfiction is probably popular and common enough to substitute some sort of subclass of games. But no one quite seems to do it like Nintendo. There's just no weight to it, it rarely feels justified or at all substantial to what the game wants to portray. If all you needed was a neat exterior to sell your game, well, you succeeded, but we're not sure it was exactly necessary. The only other example we could think of that manages to capture this Nintendo essence in effective use of aesthetics or having that inform your mechanics would be Media Molecule, with their games Little Big Planet and Tearaway. One being a DIY platform level creator that takes on the appearance of simple craft to make everything feel approachable as something you could create yourself. It wants you to see the seams in its foundation, just so you can understand how it's made and be encouraged to create something of your own. They want you to think that you could make that. The other being Tearaway, which sees you guiding an inhabitant of a fictional realm by really hammering home the player as their own entity in the story and allowing you to not just play around with fun craft-inspired game ideas but also decorate and personalize a substantial chunk of the experience. The game even encourages you to bring the fictional reality into your own by giving you schematics from the game world to print out, fold and realize in real life. In fact, Tearaway might even be the best possible example of hard aesthetic and skeuomorphism in games. But it isn't as widely known and popularized as Nintendo's constantly recurring use of the concept. We wouldn't have learned half as much from just Tearaway alone. It's likely that Tearaway wouldn't even exist had it not been for the groundwork done by Nintendo beforehand. Regardless of ultimate execution, they were just ultimately a better example. And that's valuable, because a takeaway from learning about how someone does something really good, possibly even in the best way, is that you can learn from it, perhaps even in some way surpassing the masters at their craft. We would love it if game developers started thinking more and more about the intricate relationship graphics can have with game mechanics, not just in, say, hardware limitation or capability, but by thinking in line with your aesthetic choices. It's an effective and exciting way to fuel and justify your presentation to make your game feel as tight and well thought out as possible. And to reconnect full circle with that Norman Rockwell piece again, 
He took the simple concept of a self-portrait and came up with a fun and clever idea that played around with the core concept of what constitutes a self-portrait and created something that could only really work as such. And perhaps that's just what great artists do. Look at what they have and do anything and everything possible with it. Thank you for watching all the way to the end. This video was made possible by our patrons. And they are... Abigail Neil, Ali Menfel, Andreas, Andreas Arglander, Andrew Jones, Anonymous, Ashel Seasucker, Afayet, Aaron Rain, Bald Space Marine 33, Basklin, Ben Clark, Ben personally approves this message, Via Panda, Botch Frivari, Case Explosion, Chloe, Clara Rose, Cult of the Aina, David J. Bradley, Eli Berg Maas, Ember, Emerolin, Emrasa, Flynn Flamberg, Fluffquist, Gage McCulgan, Goblin, Gothic Garfield, Huang Wu, I'm a dumb baby, Isaac Abramson, Jerry Olson, Joel Nilsson, Karen Schultz, Lantu, Luke, MM, Magnus, Mar B, Matthias Graman, Maximilian John, Melang Rubin, Meow Mix 64, Miko, Morgan, Nate Kiernan, Nishvet, Oscar Funes Galindo, Preston Manis, Riley Rose Smith, Ro, Silly Rookie, Starfighter, Sweet Pink, TB Skyen, Tegan Bread, Dad Jess, Tobias Matson, Tommy Hawkinson, Trash Baby, Tough Emily, Vexelbun, Salty Boy, and Saifi. If you also want to appear in the credits of these videos, you can support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash transparence. By doing so, you also get access to our Discord, where we and a bunch of fun people hang out. So, do it. Join us! Join us and talk about Sonic's... Arms. <laughs>